I left university and I joined Softwire as a coder. Um, that, was, that was my first job. Um, the first language that I used was classic ASP. And I'm guessing that a few of you guys are probably too young to remember classic ASP, which is what came before .NET. And I just want you to know that you should be daily grateful for not knowing what classic ASP is. Um, I also did some stuff with C, C++, and then moving on to Java. And .NET, when it arrived, we, we had it explained to us as being told that this was Microsoft basically rewriting Java so that they could have their own version. Um, so I worked as a coder, and I actually, I'm one of these people, I like to do new things, I like to try new things out. So I actually tried every single different role within the company. So I went from being a developer to being a project manager to working on the sales team, and last year I was appointed as managing director. So, oh, I've just realized I haven't got a clicker. <laughs> Should look like this. So um, what we do at Software is we make bespoke systems for businesses. So um, an anything that you can't buy off the shelf, um, we, can, we can build for you. And we work across all different uh, technologies. And we work across all different industries. So we make a lot of systems for the BBC. We made their system that they've just used for the Glastonbury footage, um, for the Glastonbury coverage by the BBC, which was really well, well received. And we also build um, pricing engines for insurance companies, banking software, and so on. So what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to go through a few definitions of what we mean when we say legacy code. Um, I'm going to talk about um, how at Softwire we go about developing non-legacy code. Um, I'm then going to talk about why this doesn't work <laughs> when you try and cross-apply it. Um, and then I'm going to go through some ideas for how you can work effectively with legacy code. I'm going to talk about non-code issues, which I will explain when I get there. And then finally, I'm going to explain why I think this means you need to measure how fast you're changing rather than just where you are. So first up, um, what is legacy code? And I'm going to get the definition out the way to start with. It's a very neat definition. It's a very clever definition, but it's not quite what I'm talking about. Uh, you may have heard that uh, all code is legacy code. So uh, as soon as you write a piece of code, someone's going to have to start maintaining it. Uh, it's already legacy code. Um, that's not what I'm talking I think that's neat. I think that's clever. I think everyone should be bearing that in mind when they're writing code. Um, but I'm talking more about. Um, legacy systems, you know, old, old pieces of code. So another definition is from Wikipedia. The Wikipedia definition says, legacy code is source code that relates to a no longer supported or manufactured operating system or other computer technology. So that's quite a dry definition. Um, a, a, more, a more punchy definition is, is your code easy to change? Can you get nearly instantaneous feedback when you do change it? Do you understand it? If the answer to any of these questions is no, you have legacy code, and it is draining time and money away from your development efforts. So that's more talking about what legacy code isn't, but I think it really helps you get the picture. A condensed version of that last description is actually just to say that legacy code is any code that doesn't have tests for it. And that's a very interesting definition and um, the one we'll be using most in this talk. Um, but my favorite, um, and this isn't really a definition of legacy code, it's more a description of legacy code, but I think it's absolutely amazing. Legacy code, the phrase strikes disgust into the hearts of programmers. It conjures images of slogging through a murky swamp of tangled undergrowth with leeches beneath and stinging flies above. It conjures odors of murk, slime, stagnancy, and offal. Although our first joy of programming may have been intense, the misery of dealing with legacy code is often sufficient to extinguish that flame. So I think that's quite a good description of what I mean when I say legacy code. So let's, let's, uh, let's lighten it up again. Let's talk about. Um, General, general coding practices. So over the 13 years since I started at Softwire, we've come to 
um, kind of recognize our own set of what is a good way to develop code. And this matches with um, what most other people think in the industry. So not everyone agrees on everything, but in general, there's come to be like a, a general way of going about developing code. Um, and a, these ideas aren't all like startlingly new. It's not like people only came up with them last year, but it's taken time for them to filter through into everyone's consciousness. And now they form this kind of classic way of doing things. So I'll give you a few examples of that. Um, the first one is what we call clean code practices. I don't know if that's a term you're familiar with. Um, so having uh, small and precise comments, if necessary, trying to make your code self-documenting, um, trying to keep methods small and, and testable, trying to make sure you uh, break your dependencies, you don't have dependencies between code, and you encapsulate your concerns. So all of those kind of um, what I call clean code practices they're really important. Um, when I started as a coder, um, we used to have um, these really big kind of boxy comments that we made out of little equal signs. So at the start of every class, you'd have this like big comment that you kind of open your class, it takes up almost all of the page. Um, and so we've kind of been gradually learning and um, improving the way that we go about coding. Um, another example, uh, which is very germane to what we're talking about, is testing in particular unit testing. So testing obviously has been around as long as software has. It's just that in the old days, we used to do it by um, kind of coding, coding frantically and then leaving a month at the end if we were lucky to actually go through and test things and find things and fix them. Um, and that kind of works to a certain extent. Um, but there, it's obviously not very pleasant if you've actually been through one of these uh, system test periods uh, with, with everything kind of breaking and needing to be fixed and retested and so on. But also, it's very hard to, if you make a fix, to actually go through just for one fix and retest all of your code. But actually, if your code isn't well written and your, your components aren't encapsulated, you actually do, every time to make one fix, you should be going through and testing all the code. Um, so you actually stop yourself from testing your code properly by using those kind of, those kind of methods. Um, so for us, we've gone from unit testing being something that's like, oh, it's a bit tedious, do we have to do this, to it, to it being mandatory on all of, our, all of our projects, all of our new code bases that we start. You know, like the first thing you do is work out your testing framework, get it set up. Before you do, before you do any coding, that's, that's how important it is. So the other thing that um, has, we've kind of refined, and I would now say we use a standard practice, is agile development. And I'm pretty sure, can I have hands up from anyone here who doesn't know what I mean when I say agile development? No? OK, so um, I'll run through what we mean by it. This is a broad term. There are many different types of agile development um, and many kind of specific ways of doing things. But what I mean are general we, we don't adhere dogmatically to any of these definitions, and I don't think it's necessarily a good idea to do so, but there are lots of really, really useful tools that you can use um, as part of your software delivery. So the first one is stand-ups. So stand-ups are just short meetings at the start of every day, and it allows the team to tell each other what's going on and make sure that everyone knows what's happening, everyone knows if there are blockers, um, uh, you, you know, if someone's about to start working on a bit of code that you've been working on, and you can share information really effectively. And the reason they're called stand-ups is because you have to do them standing up. So most meetings you do, you do sitting down. Um, but the problem with sitting down, well, <laughs> the reason you do them sitting down is that sitting down is quite comfortable. Um, but that's the problem with sitting down, right? So you go in a meeting, you sit down, you're having a chat, someone says something, you don't really agree with it, you think, oh, well, you know, uh, I, better, I better rebut that. You have a big, long chat about it, and then you've wasted half your day. If you've got like six people or 10 people in a room, you can spend a lot of time in a meeting, and that's not the point of stand-ups. The point is they need to be quick, they need to be to the point. So just by forcing everyone to stand up, <laughs> they're a lot shorter. So that's, that's um, a good example of uh, an agile tool that I, most people use. We use that across all of our teams. Um, Burn-up charts are something else we use. So assigning points to the, the work you're going to do, and then mapping how many points you've closed off against your delivery date and how long you've got. It's a really effective way of measuring progress. Um, 
We use something called sprints from Scrum where you develop in iterations. So agile development in general is all about iterative development. So can you do a small bit, check it, do another small bit rather than trying to build a big system in one go. So we do these short sprints and at the end of every sprint we do a retrospective which is about looking back at what we did that sprint, how we can make it better, how we can change what we're doing and do something different in the next two weeks than we did in the last two weeks in order to make it better. So these are, these are all concepts that um, are definitely well spread throughout software. I think they're quite well spread throughout the industry. Um, and they're great. And you get a new project, you know what to do, you've got your best practices for how to do it. But when you get to legacy code, you find that you can't use a lot of these techniques. So remember, legacy code, the definition, it's a swamp, you're trying, to, you're trying to change things, it's not tested. And the issue is that when you make a change to a computer system, you need to know what change in behavior you're trying to achieve, right? You need to know um, what you want the system to do when you've made this change. So what that usually means is you have like one small piece of functionality, and it used to do this, now you want it to do this, and an important kind of uh, sub-corollary is that you don't want anything else to be changed. So you want everything else to do exactly what it did, and you want this one small piece of code to go, or this one small output of your system to go from this to this. Um, so in order to be able to do this, you need to know what your system is supposed to do. So you need some form of documentation of what the system does. Now, the, the form this documentation takes nowadays for most new software projects that have been started like you know, in the last 10 years is unit tests. Because when you've got a really good um, suite of unit tests covering your code, they tell you what each piece of functionality does. Because you can see whether it's right or not and giving you the right output because the unit test will pass. If the unit test fails, it's wrong. This is really, really super useful. Um, what we've had for systems before we had unit tests is sometimes we've had uh, written documentation. So, and so you, you write out exactly what's supposed to happen at every point with the system. It's brilliant, it's great. You've got a manual, essentially. Um, but what happens is very swiftly this manual gets out of date and people don't update it and then once it's out of date, people stop updating it. So you've got no way to tell what your code is supposed to be doing. So by having a lack of tests, you kind of have a lack of verified functionality. Um, I'll give you a specific example of this. So let's suppose I've got a pricing engine and the customers reported a bug to me or the users reported a bug to me saying when I put 20 into this engine, I expect to get 50 out the other end, but I'm getting 40 out. So I can go through the code and I can find something that affects the number that comes out the other end, and I can maybe say add 10 to it. Great, problem solved. Well, now when I put in 20, I get out 50. Has it broken anything else? I have literally no idea whether it's broken everything else unless I have a list of all the inputs and all the outputs, right? Unless, unless I know what's supposed to happen in every single case, I can't test whether it's broken anything. So when you have a, a, a legacy code base, which we're defining as a code base without tests, every time you make a change, you're running a really, really serious risk of breaking stuff, um, which makes it very hard to edit and very unpleasant to edit, which makes it like this, that, like this swamp, basically. So OK, so what are we going to do about this? We've got this code base. The problem is it's not tested. OK, I've got the answer. We should add the tests in, right? Great, let's spend, we'll spend a whole bunch of money and time and we'll add all these tests in and everything will be fine. Um, which is a neat idea, right? It's like the obvious solution. So to start with, you're going to have to unpick some of this code because it's not nicely separated out for you to write tests around. So you're going to need to start changing it and refactoring it so that you can apply tests. Sounds simple. But we've just said that every time we change a piece of code, we run the risk of breaking it So because we've got no tests. So when we want to change the code to allow us to write tests, we can't because we haven't got any tests. It's kind of circular, and we're basically stuck. So that, that's, that's the kind of impasse. 
So um, there's another solution. Uh, another another solution is you could say, right, okay, no, no, we've got it, we've got it. This is, this is like legacy code, it's horrible. No one wants to work with it, it's never gonna work. We'll throw it all away. Let's throw it away, we don't need that. Those people wrote it over there and they were rubbish developers and they didn't know what they were doing. We know what we're doing, we're gonna write good code now. Excellent, let's, let's, do, it. let's do it. And if time and money were no object, this is an awesome solution. And you can do it. And if you can develop infinitely quickly, at, you know, no cost, perfect. However, in the real world, um, if you're a business, right, everyone is writing software for businesses that make money. Um, if you're not, again, you can do whatever you want. Most people, if, you're, if you've got a job as a programmer, you're writing code for businesses you have to make money. And as a business, you have to measure what comes in against what goes out, and you have to match them up. So you're always thinking about costs. And you, if you've got a system that does almost everything you want it to do, um, and you've got a choice of sticking with this system or spending six or seven figures building that system again using proper coding practices, it's not going to work. It, it doesn't make sense for the business. That, deci that business decision is never going to get taken. So that's not a solution either. So what do we do? Well, luckily, Lots of very clever people have spent a lot of time thinking very hard about this problem. One of these guys is Michael Feathers. Um, and what, what's the way you get a breakthrough? So this is a really hard problem. The reason this really impresses me is because dealing with legacy code is a really, really hard problem. What to do when you're faced with this kind of morass of <laughs> of code, of untested code, you don't know where to start. It's a really, really hard problem to solve. Um, so there's quite a lot of lateral thinking that's gone into some of the ideas into this book. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through some of the general principles, um, but I'm not going to go into examples in detail. If you do want to see, there are lots of code examples in the book. He uses lots of different languages and tries to explain things in a way that you can apply them to the language that you're using. Um, so do take a look. Um, at the book. Um, it's also very cleverly designed as reference material. So if you have a problem, they'll, they'll write this out as a problem and then a solution. So if your problem is, my class is, is too big to test, there'll be like a little section called, my class is too big to test, what do I do? And then he'll tell you some practical steps for how to go about and how to go about dealing with it. Um, but yeah, I want to talk about a couple of general ideas. The first one, uh, is the idea of finding seams in your code. And one of the reasons I really like this is that it makes me think of programmers as being like kind of archaeologists, where they've got like their little chisel and they're like looking through this rock face going, where's the crack? Where's the crack? Where can I stick this chisel into the code and like inject some really good code into it? Um, and he's also kind of come up with um, well, I'll talk first about the direct ways. So there's two direct ways he talks about exploiting these themes. Um, the first one he calls sprouting. So again, the word is quite evocative. This is where you've got some code, and rather than just adding to it, so imagine, imagine your legacy code base, right? It's like a dead tree. And the way most people edit this dead tree is they just make the dead tree a bit bigger. They put some code in, it becomes legacy code. You don't even bother to try and make it nicer, because all the rest of the code base is horrible. You stick it in, you've got a bigger dead tree. So the idea of sprouting is like you have this new bit of code that, that comes off the tree. So, so, so say you've got a method, it's too big, it's untestable. Um, you want to add something quite simple into the middle of it, but rather than just adding it in the middle, you put it in a new function or you put it in a new class where you can test it properly and, and use all of your best coding practices that you know about on this code and it's kind of sprouted off from the old code. So that's quite cool. There's an issue that you can't test the points at which it sprouts off. You still can't test the old code, right? You haven't solved that problem. But you haven't created any new problems. You've got like a little green shoot of some nice code in your code base. Um, another uh, example that he uses is um, wrapping your code. And this has a really big advantage that you can leave the existing code unchanged. Because remember, one of the things we're terrified of with this code base is actually changing anything. So if you wrap the code, you basically take your method you've already had that you're quite sure, it will, at least you know it does what it's always done right. You're not going to break it if you leave it all intact. And you kind of move that out of the way and put it over here. 
and then you put a new function with the same name in its place. And so that's a good way to do things such as adding extra functionality. So say you've got a piece of code that can make a payment. You know it makes a payment. Uh, it doesn't do it in a very clean way, but rather than, and you want to add logging functionality to it. So rather than mucking about with that, you take that, you put it out the way, and then you say, you call your new logging code, which is all beautiful and pristine, and you call out to the old code. So um, you've, you've managed to, you haven't fixed everything, right? <laughs> you haven't done that at all, but you've made one small positive step, and you've added in a piece of code that is now the kind of code you want to work with. So you've made things a little bit better. Um, another thing that is great lateral thinking uh, are the other places where he finds seams. So uh, there's a seam every time you do any form of pre-processing. So this, this isn't somewhere where you would normally think of adding to your code base and changing things. But when you're, um, essentially when you're desperate, right, <laughs> when there's no other way to go about this, you need to think about what steps you can take to make things better. So pre-processing is, is one, and linking is another one. So actually, can you, rather than linking to a library that, uh, to be honest, you'd rather not work with, can you, can you leave the link in place and write a new library? Um, there's lots, of, there's lots of really clever, specific ideas of doing this. So uh, what uh, Michael Feathers holds up as the reward for doing this is that you create little islands within your code base that, that are what we'll call nice code, right? So you've got these little islands. They start as specs, OK? Um, but every time you go back and work with something you've already added, you can make it a bit better. And it gets a little bit bigger. So you get these kind of islands growing in the code base. And then one day, these islands, they start to join together, and you get like a landmass. And suddenly, like, you've got this swamp. And then in the middle, you've got this like, lemma where you can like, kind of gamble about. And you're like, hooray, hooray, oh, swamp. Oh, I'll go in the swamp for a bit. But hey, I've made the, I've made the landmass bigger. Um, and for us, the, re the reason that I'm thinking about this stuff is for us, Legacy code is still a problem, right? And I would love to be able to stand here and say, I've done it. I've seen it happen. But this takes a long time to make code bases better in this way. So hopefully, I can come back and maybe give another talk in like uh, 10 years and say, I've done it. I've done it. Here, I've created this landmass. Um, another thing that I think is quite neat about this, um, which you may have noticed from the way I've been talking about things like sprouting and so on, is that um, a lot of it is, is common sense. It's not, it's not some spectacular new technique that no one has ever come across before, right? You know, calling out to another method, putting it somewhere else, it's pretty simple. But I think by having a common language around how you go about it and a common understanding of what you do in order to make things better, I think it makes it much easier to know what to do and rather than kind of giving up and and kind of just looking at it with horror and not, not wanting to deal with it, it gives, it gives you a way to go about making it better. So I think this book is quite good. Um, I also brought a video. So if I click onto the next slide, um, I thought it might be nice as I am uh, talking with great passion about his book, just to hear a bit from Michael Feathers, who's the author of the book. So this is just an interview with him. Welcome to On Software. Conversations with thought leaders in software development. So Michael, for those of our uh, listening audience at home who don't recognize you by sight, they don't have your <laughs> posters up on their bedroom wall, Yeah, right. Uh, give us a little bit of an introduction, who you are, what you do, and uh, what, uh, what books you've done for, for various publishers. Okay, uh, my name is Michael Feathers, and um, a couple of years ago I wrote a book called Working Effectively with Legacy Code. And um, let's say I work with Object Mentor based in Chicago. And uh, we're basically a training and mentoring organization. We go around and we help people you know, learn new software development skills. And uh, we got in very early into the agile development uh, you know, uh, movement. And so I spent an awful lot of time going around helping teams transition to agile development and uh, you know, move along into various skills like test-driven development and refactoring. Mm -hmm. Object Mentor, that's uh, Bob Martin's company, correct? Yeah. Uncle yeah. Bob. OK, excellent. Um, you mentioned that you wrote this book. Yeah, Working Effectively with Legacy Work Code. Working Effectively with Legacy Code. Yeah. So when you say legacy code, what, what definition do we put behind the word legacy beyond 
code in a programming language that I just don't like. Yeah, and that's a funny thing because when I was um, working uh, to try to decide on a title for the book, um, I threw around a bunch of different ideas among friends. And um, this one kind of stuck, but I kind of knew that people would kind of misinterpret it in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, typically there is this, well, there is this dictionary definition of legacy code, which is code in an ancient technology. Code, code where you have to kind of go to eBay to get the compilers for a particular application you're working on, right? And, um, you know, so that's the dictionary definition. But the thing is there's also this, this pejorative, you know, sense in which the word legacy, or the term legacy code is used. And mm -hmm. um, to kind of, uh, you know, give a, an example of that, a friend of mine, Eric Mead, called me up one time when he was... Um, working with a new client, and I said, well, you know, what are you doing? And he says, oh, you know, we're working on this and this. And I said, well, how's the team doing? And he says, well, they're writing legacy code. And, you know, when I heard that, I thought, wow. You know, it's just like he <laughs> kind of put in that one term everything that I tend to feel at times when I'm working with various groups. Right. That there's lots of code out there that, you know, you may have written yesterday, but still, when you look at it, you realize that it's just, you know, ill-mannered, ill-structured. It will be hard to change over time. So it's not really a question of the technology as much as it is the uh, just, attitude you know, by well, which it was ad, written? Pretty much the entropy. You know, it's kind of like over okay. time as you change code, if you aren't refactoring as you go along, you just end up with code which is really kind of hard to change. You have classes that just kind of grow and just become these, these hideous messes. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, uh, it's very awkward. It's, uh, it's a big deal for many companies because they'd like to add features in as fast as they possibly can. Mm -hmm. But um, a lot of code really isn't amenable to change in any sense. Mm -hmm. so. So when you talk about you know working effectively with legacy code, what are you describing? Are you talking about how to refactor C++ and C and Pascal and, and those other languages, or are you talking about something else? Well, it's it's kind of um, it's a bit of refactoring, but it's really more like a precursor to refactoring in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, when I first saw Martin Fowler's book on refactoring back in 1999, he was circulating drafts right before it was released, and I looked at it and I thought, wow, this is great. And I started to try to refactor code that I had and it tended to work out okay. As I became a consultant and went around to various companies, I realized that the real issue was that there were a lot of people who would like to be able to refactor, but they didn't really have tests in place to be able to go and support that refactoring. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, Martin was very explicit in the book saying, look, if you want to try to do these things, put tests in place first. Otherwise, you know, you're going to go and do all sorts of things that may change behavior and you just simply won't know. Well, sure. I mean, the whole point of refactoring says I'm modifying code without without breaking it, right? Where, right? where break means I get different behavior than I had before. And the big question is, how do you know? Right, right. exactly. Without yeah. a unit test, there's no way to know, except perhaps anecdotally. Well, I ran it and it didn't crash. Yeah, yeah. You know? So I guess um, it, would, it would seem to imply mm -hmm. that you know, working effectively with legacy code, refactoring, in order to get to refactoring legacy code, one has to be able to unit test legacy code, correct? Right. Yeah, and that's... So how do we do that? Because last time I checked, there wasn't a legacy unit. Yeah, and well, fortunately, we have the X unit family, like J unit, CPP unit, right. you know, .NET unit, N unit. Um, you can use those tools to do this kind of work, but the, the real big thing, though, is you have to go and basically do some work to break dependencies inside the code that you've got. Okay. And the thing that makes that really difficult is that, you know, I don't know, I try it. It's, it's one of those things I often mention to people. Take some arbitrary class that you have in your application and try to write tests for it and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And I think that people don't really appreciate how coupled their code is until they try to go and work with one class in isolation. It's often a, a real eye-opening experience. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a series of things that you can do which are really kind of refactorings, but they're very conservative refactorings. I call them dependency breaking techniques, things right. that you can do by hand that have a very low likelihood of introducing errors. As you start to go and take some of these, do, you know, basically perform some of these operations, you can go and break I got to well what, Like what? what? What kind of things well, are you Well, you know, one of them is one that uh, Martin Fowler wrote up, Extract Interface. It's kind of right. nice that's built into many refactoring IDs these right. days. Right. Um, another one which is kind of interesting is called Introduce Instance Delegator. And this is something which um, comes up where, you know, I, most people have these classes, utility classes that have oodles and oodles of static methods, right? right. What happens if you have some code behind one of those static methods that does something you wouldn't like to have happen in the test? Well, you have okay. to find some way to go and get past that. And um, you know, an easy way of approaching this is to go and add an instance method to that class that delegates to the static method. Uh, change the code in place so it goes and uses an instance rather than uses the static method. Mm -hmm. And um, it's kind of awkward because it does kind of uglify some areas of code, but it does have the advantage of going and making it easier to go and write tests for certain areas of right. code. Right. So um, another common one is parameterizing the constructor. You know, if you have some dependency inside of your code that is really kind of awkward, um, 
code you wouldn't want to execute in test, like you know, firing off a crudest missile or something. You know, it's like that's great in a production system if that's what your system does. But to actually write a test that really does that sort of thing, mm -hmm. very awkward. Um, to go and basically take the dependencies you have inside of a class and basically pass them in through the constructor. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we've seen that in Java now that basically we have dependency injection frameworks like Spring right. and the other, right. you know. Uh, and uh, those are very nice, but it's kind of nice to go and see that you can just apply that, that transformation at a low level without going full bore into Spring, you know, mm -hmm. for instance, to, uh, to make some code more testable. So yeah. the interesting question that comes up then for a lot of these legacy systems, you know, the the I.O., the only real practical place where we have the ability to inject input and harvest output is at yeah. the database level. Yeah. Right. And does that basically imply, I mean, can I unit test something that plugs, you know, that, that, that uses database as my I.O. facility or do, I mean, do I have to use some kind of database unit or something along those lines? Well, you know, it's one of those things you can do just about anything. It's a question of what the long-term consequences can mm -hmm. be. Um, I've worked with teams where they basically try to test using a real database or even their own mocked up data in an existing uh, schema. And um, it can work okay for a while, but you get to the point where your test takes so long to run because you're making these round trips back to the database, right. and back and forth right. to the database. Exactly. And you're marching along, you're doing this, you write test after test after test after test, and eventually you start to slow down and you realize that, you know, wow, I'm not writing as many tests before and as before. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, if you really reflect on it, you realize that the reason why is because they just take so long to run. And right. Nobody wants to write them, nobody wants to run them and go on with those things. So in general, it's really good to be able to go and put some kind of an isolation layer between yourself and the database. And, um, and then you sort of mock the access to the database? Yeah, mock the access to the database and okay. you can basically feed that back into some other area of your test harness where you supply only enough fake data to go and make this one particular test exercise the code you want to exercise. Right. Either pass or fail. Yeah. And, uh, go now this, this, I guess, raises the question then, um, when I approach a legacy system, when yeah. I approach a, a monolithic pile of code, right, and I'm staring at the fact that, you know, this legacy system is what it is, and to try to tease it apart and to try to break it into nice, independent, testable pieces represents a huge engineering effort. Mm -hmm. Is there any value in saying, you know what, I'm going to punt on that idea, and instead I just want to treat the legacy as a black box, yeah. and I want to just test inputs and outputs, and assume that you know, if if every time I plug in A, I get X, then every time I plug in A, I will get X. Yeah, you can do that, and it's really it's one of those questions about the question is really whether you can get the coverage you want to get for the changes you want to make, right? Okay. So if you're dealing with it as a black box and you're basically adjusting inputs and checking outputs, you know, it's a great strategy if you want to get in there and actually make some changes. If you want to refactor something or add new capabilities in, um, having those test points can allow you to go and basically have some cover for that kind of work. Right. Um, many people really aren't in that situation where if they are, it's often harder to go and basically get the exact test cases that you would need to go and exercise the exact portion of logic you want to. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's a bit of a trade-off there. And um, you know, I, I've kind of found over and over again with this that as valuable as the higher level tests are, it's nice to have the skill to go and deal with things at a lower level and say, mm -hmm. look, you know, I know that I have this monstrously large method. I'd like to be able to go and make some change here. What small amount of testing can I inject into this to go and have confidence in just this one change that I want to make? Mm -hmm. And that often requires just a bit of dependency breaking you know, pretty much at the unit level. And um, yeah, you, you go back and forth between the high level and the low level, but uh, it's, it's, it's odd. It's really kind of hard to find the right spot. There are some tools that have been coming yeah. out recently in, in the Java and the .NET space, and to a lesser degree, the C++ space, mm -hmm. to do some of these kinds of static analysis, dependency view, you know, let yeah. me see what is, what is the degree of coupling or the degree of cohesion between any two parts of the system and mm -hmm. so forth. Do you find those to be useful, or is that marketing hype? Well, I haven't used any of those really in earnest. Um, I used JDepend, you know, a while ago, and mm -hmm. I thought that was a very, you know, handy tool. Uh, when I come in and I work with a team, I'm typically working with their knowledge of their system and okay. asking the questions and going forward with things. Uh, but invariably, I find that, you know, it, the work that you're going to do is really um, forced to some degree by the changes that people want to make. Okay. Right? And you know, it's, it's funny, when you look at a very large application, you know, regardless of language, C++, C Sharp, Java, um, you're not going to be 
touching each piece equally. You know, over time you're gonna have hot spots that you go back to over and over and over again. Right. And those are the right. areas where you really want to go and do a bit of investigation and figure out, you know, uh, if I get tests around this particular area, will that give me cover enough to do the work that I need to do over time? For more information, visit onpodcastweekly.com and subscribe to all our podcasts. Brought to you by the podcast. Hooray, thank you. So um, I left it as uh, everything was solved, everything was sorted, but it's not. <laughs> so we've got some really great um, ways, like actual technical ways to deal with our code and make our code better. But actually, I think there are also some what I call non-code issues with um, sorting out our legacy code. Um, and that's, that's what we found at Softwire. So we've, we've been reading this book, we've been trying to incorporate it into how we do, but it's, it's, not, it's not just knowing what to do, it's also having the will to do it, to actually go through with it. Um, and to go back to the swamp analogy, right? If you've got this, this, this swamp and it's very unpleasant and there's leeches and bugs biting you and it smells of awful um, and you've got to get through it. You actually know that you can get through it by going left foot, right foot. You know that's how you get through it. You just don't want to go through it. You don't want to. You'd rather just, you'd rather go make a cup of tea or play a game of pool or do anything other than actually getting on and sorting it out. Um, so we've got an issue of, of motivation to deal with. And I think that the, the reason behind this issue is at the top of the mountain. So where you're trying to get to, this utopia of this perfect maintainable code base, it's too far away. So you can't see it. You, you want to do the right thing and you want to get there, but you can't motivate yourself to do it because it's too far away. Um, and I've got an analogy for this. Um, I'm quite a big fan of analogies, but there's a story about jellyfish. I don't know if anyone's heard this story about jellyfish. This guy goes down to the beach and it's completely littered with jellyfish. So all of these jellyfish have been washed up onto the shore. And there's like, you know, in this bit of beach, there's like hundreds of them. And you look down the beach and it goes all the way down the beach. It's like covered in jellyfish. Um, and then this guy sees, so he's kind of like, oh, you know, what, what are we going to do with jellyfish? They're all going to die. Uh, and he sees this one guy standing by the sea and he's picking up the jellyfish and he's like picking them up one at a time and throwing them in the sea. And he goes over to me and says, why are you bothering to pick up the jellyfish? It, you can't make any difference. There's, there's thousands of them. You can't make any difference just by throwing one back in. And, and the guy kind of picks it up one up and throws it and he says, I made a difference for that jellyfish. And I think there's, there's two ways of looking at the problem. If you look at it on a big scale, you can't sort it out immediately. But if you work on it piece by piece, you can make things a little bit, a little bit better. And I think that's rewarding and I think it is worthwhile. So that is, in essence, my theory. So I think you need to, what you need to focus on is how fast, focus on that you're improving and how fast you're improving, rather than just looking at where you are. Rather than just saying, all right, well, we're here, we've got a little bit of code that's better over here, but most of it's still rubbish. You know, there's, there's no point thinking like that because it won't motivate you to get on and do the job. Instead, you have to think about how, how much are we getting faster? You know, how much better are we than last week? And what does that mean if, if we draw a graph of it? So, um, this, this idea as well fits in for me um, with something that I do in, you know, in my role as MD, and that's coaching. So by, by coaching, I mean helping people to get better at their job. And the concept of coaching comes from sports. You have a guy, he, he's there to help people get better, improve their technique, and so on. And the type of coaching I use, it's really, really good for problems that aren't subject to analysis. So most analysis is totally, totally awesome. And being in a culture where we get to use analysis all the time, it's great. It solves lots of problems. It solves a lot of software problems, right? The way to, you've got a problem in your code and you look at the code, you write somewhere in here and then you kind of break it down. And you go, right, the problem somewhere in here and you break it down, you go, the problem somewhere and eventually you get to it and you can sort it out. 
But when you're trying to apply that to people, it doesn't work. Um, and it's actually just to do with a kind of psychology and human nature that if you adopt this kind of analytic approach, all people hear is, there's a problem, there's a problem, there's a problem. And as it gets more and more specific, all they hear is, oh, there's a problem, it's awful, it's awful. So if you, if you kind of think about um, dealing with legacy code in that way, just going through all the ways in which it's horrible and trying to solve it, it just doesn't work. Um, so the type of coaching I use is called the solutions focus. I also like this because it's quite like agile. So the way it works is to say, where do you want to get to? And then it says, what changes can I make, right? Because if you want something to be different, you've got to make a change. What changes can I make? Um, make them. Did they help? If they helped, keep doing them. If they didn't help, stop doing them. So taking this over to dealing with legacy code, this is how we're going about dealing with legacy code at the moment. Um, it's early stages for us doing this, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to refine it and, and get better and better and better at it. But basically, the first thing we do is um, we take the code base. Um, we want to use these um, specific techniques whenever we make a change to improve the code incrementally. But usually, there's also like a whole bunch of stuff when you start. So may maybe there's some frameworks that aren't up to date. Maybe your unit test framework isn't up to date, and you need to do that before you can actually start using the test functionality you need to improve things. Um, maybe there are, there are um, negotiations to be had with previous owners of the code base or other stakeholders in the code base to actually get them to allow you to make the kind of changes you want to make. So what we do is we make a big list of what all the things are we want to change about the code base. Um, obviously, that is a bit negative and it makes everyone a bit sad, but you get it out of the way, you get it into a big list. And then we prioritize this list because you can only do things one at a time. So you've got to do things in some order. So pick, pick the things that are most important to you, either because you get the best return or because they're giving you the most pain, or for whatever reason, make it into a list so you know what you're dealing with. Um, and then you can have two different types of burn-up chart. So you have your burn-up chart for delivery. So that tells you how fast you're delivering um, to whoever, the, end, you know, whoever the, the client is, if it's um, another organization or the end user or the product owner, whoever you're delivering functionality to, that will tell you how fast you're delivering that because you'll need to keep delivering functionality. But at the same time, you can have another burn up chart that you put your code base changes into and your measures of, of how you're improving your code base. And you can use that as a separate burn up chart um, so that you can measure your progress. And in the same way that a traditional delivery burn-up chart helps to motivate you um, to do this week's work now. Um, so usually, like say delivery date is six months away, it's actually really hard to divide the total work by like uh, the, the fraction you've got to get done this week and actually get it done because it's ages away. You know, you, you can kind of worry about it later. You could work a bit, uh, you know, a bit harder in the last week. But having a burn-up chart means that you, you can see the line, and you can see how important it is to stick to the line, and you can see if you start veering away from the line. So if you can set yourself a velocity for how fast you want to make changes and improve your code base, then you can measure how you're doing against that line, and you can remain motivated to keep improving the code base, even though it's going to be a long time until it's perfect. So. Uh, I have just a quote to finish with. Um, it's another quote by um, Michael Feathers. Um, but this quote is, programming is the art of doing one thing at a time. And I think that, that really sums up how to go about this um, how, and how to get to where you're going by taking one small step at a time and not looking up to the top and, and losing um, losing focus and feeling that like you're going to fall off, but keeping going steadily and looking at your, your line of how you're doing and improving one step at a time. So thank you very much. Um, happy to take any questions. We've got about 10 minutes for questions, I think, if anyone's got any questions. Hello, at the back. Actually, maybe I'm not uh, eligible to ask a question because I just came here like five minutes ago. 
but how does that relate to reinforcement learning that we are using in artificial intelligence? Um, because basically what you're doing is you get a reinforcement whenever you do something good and whenever you're doing something bad then you shouldn't do it so you get a punishment um, um, have you had uh, ha, are you taking that idea from reinforcement learning or what is it no that I mean I, th I think that what you have described in terms of reinforcement learning is exactly the idea that I'm trying to use here right because okay. when you're talking about reinforcement learning you're talking about how people's brains work and what motivates people to do things so so yes what i'm saying is you yeah reward is what it's all about and okay. if you're doing something and it feels thankless and it feels like you're not making a difference and it feels like however much of yourself you throw into it it will never get any better you will stop doing it that is human nature you you won't carry on doing it Whereas um, the kind of rewards we respond to as humans are actually, uh, they can be quite small and they can yeah. be even kind of non-tangible. You know, the concept of being rewarded by a line on a graph being in the right place, um, it, it is just how human beings work. It doesn't have to be money. It, it can literally be, this is good, we know it's good, and now we feel rewarded. Yeah, I totally agree too. Thanks. Okay, awesome. Um, we had a, a question down here. Oh, the job of jogging around with a microphone. Hi. Um, I started to develop uh, a PHP application, and I started without uh, testing. And uh, after that, I tried to look for test-driven, uh, uh, development-driven technique. And I set up my environments and set mm, for uh, the w this web application. And um, after that, I look for Selenium um, is a tool that um, look for the browsers that test functionalities. I don't know if you know. So. And uh, after that, um, this test, the functionalities that uh, the tests that I created uh, lose a lot of times to test more two or three functionalities to inside the browser. And after I, I give up because uh, um, I, sp I thought uh, if I have to develop uh, and uh, after uh, before I have to write the test and after develop uh, and I have to um, uh, check for all the tests uh, and uh, for free test I spent uh, mo one minute to that uh, look for all if, if uh, some nodes inside HTML are inside or not uh, wha what I have to do if I uh, will have uh, a very rich application and uh, um, with a lot of pages with a lot of features uh, and uh, after that um, I, I give up for this reason at the mm -hmm. moment uh, but I'm still considering to 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 develop in uh, TDD but uh, 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 for the moment, I prefer to develop and uh, stay focused for development. Uh, what you su can suggest when uh, someone is approaching in this way and um, evaluate performances in, in for testings, uh, and uh, it, it looks r not a good uh, choice. Um, I think that's a really, really great question, and it actually covers off um, two areas. And the first one, that I haven't kind of said explicitly, but is really, really important, is that writing code is really hard. So every so often, someone will come and say, oh, writing code's really easy. And it's like, really? Well, how, how are you writing it? Yeah. You know, does it do what you want, or have you written really good code? So writing code is hard. And testing your code um, in a comprehensive way, the kind of test we're talking about, where you have coverage of your code that gives you a safety net when you're going to make changes, is hard. So it's, it's difficult. Um, the second thing is, is that doing test-driven development, so I'm just talking about making sure you have some tests in place and you have written some tests. Test-driven development is a kind of art form. Um, it's a way of developing. And if you go and read some books on test-driven development, there's, there's a kind of iterative method of how you define your tests and how you write test code and code intermittently. Um, I, can't, I can't actually do this. It's really hard. But I know that if I wanted to go and code like that, I would have to learn, and I would have to spend a lot of time learning. Um, so that's the, that's the first point I want to make. And then the second point is we're back to motivation, right? Because this is, this is what, what all humans are like. And I've had enough situations where I've been in a difficult situation and I've given up. 
and, and go back to 13 years when I started coding, someone would say, you really need to have some unit tests. And I'd be like, oh, unit tests, have to write a test. It's really boring. It's taken ages. And now it runs. And it takes ages to run as well. And so I can't do any coding. And it's getting in my way. I want to give up. And I want to not do it. Um, but if you, if you want to be a professional software developer, and you want to be a good software developer, then you need to go and learn how to do this. Um, you know, motivation can be quite a personal thing, but something that really motivates me in my career is to think that it's all about learning. And I think, actually, if you view the world as being all about learning, and you see things as a challenge that you can kind of engage with, rather than a threat that you have to run away from, I think that can be really positive and really help you. So I, th I think my advice would be try and find people you can learn from and accept that learning things is difficult. Like, um, say, you were, say you were trying to learn the violin, right? Um, you'd, you'd want to pick it up and be able to play it. You know, I've, I've also been in that exact position. <laughs> um, but you, you can't do that. You have to practice. You have to practice every day for a long period to be able to do things well. And writing good code is that hard. Um, so I think you're asking the right questions, and you should go and do it and learn. And yeah. OK. Um, I'm convinced that uh, TDD are a very good um, mm -hmm. um, way of work. Yeah. But uh, the, the um, I found myself in a situation that I have to choose uh, um, that test uh, for um, uh, my application um, make me test uh, waste time to testing uh, and uh, because I had a lot of functionalities to test so on the if I have to move after I have to wait the test process uh, that are were very very slow so um, and it was not uh, mine it was not a motivation yep. issue uh, it was for uh, for me. I, I I'm still learning. I'm still uh, keeping uh, development uh, in this way. But yes, for backend is okay. But for the front end is some most of the time for this this particular uh, aspect is very. Is, it was very hard. Yep. Um. Again, you're right. Testing the front end is more difficult. Testing mobile apps is even more difficult. Um. The the kind of issue of it, and essentially the. The, uh, the only real advice I've got to give is that these things are difficult and you need to practice getting better at them. So if you've got a problem that your tests are so slow to run that you, you can't develop code and run your tests, then that's an issue and it needs to be solved. But you can't solve it by throwing away the tests. You need to solve it by working out how to make those tests quicker. Um, and and it's, it's difficult. It's just as difficult as coding. Um, but you have to see it as uh, the time spent fixing that is good time spent because you're learning while you do it. Uh, any more questions? I've got two minutes if anyone's got a last question. OK, good, because I did actually also want to do a little plug. You'll see some writing up here. Um, I, I work at Software Technology, and um, we're a bespoke software house uh, making systems for businesses. Um, and I'd just like to say, if anyone is interested in coming and joining us uh, and helping us learn more about legacy code and coding in general and helping us solve difficult programming um, problems that, that we come across every day, please do send us an email. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>